So I am uh, Cody Hansen. I'm the director of web development for the University of Minnesota Libraries. Um, I'd like to point out at the outset here that that does not say electronic resources librarian, does not say systems librarian. I'm, uh, I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle than some of you may be. Um, we have excellent uh, electronic resources and systems folks at, at Minnesota. Um, I, uh, I manage a small team that happens to for accidents of history and organizational, uh, um, you know, organizational reasons. Uh, we manage the proxy server, and uh, it's uh, comes become something that I care quite a bit about. Um, and uh, so my background is not necessarily in, in all the same issues that, that some of yours might be. Um, my background is actually in user experience, um, and I would like to acknowledge at the outset the irony of someone with a background in user experience defending the proxy server. Um, I, uh, as, as some of you have, may have had the misfortune to learn already, I'm not shy with my opinions um, about these technologies and, and how they're implemented. Um, so I feel like I should acknowledge that I am here from the University of Minnesota Libraries, but not representing the University of Minnesota Libraries. My views are my own, um, and, and I have some. Uh, so I, I just want to begin by uh, saying thank you to all of you. I've really, really enjoyed our conversations over the past day and a half. I think this has been a really interesting opportunity to, um, to share ideas. I want to thank, um, in particular, Todd and Jill for um, reserving space in the agenda for this, uh, this conversation specifically, because I think it's, I think, I hope it will be valuable. Um, I want to give some additional thanks uh, to some of my colleagues. Uh, Sunshine Carter, who is our electronic resources librarian, whose input has been really valuable as I've wrestled with some of these issues. Also, Chris Bongartz, who is uh, lead, uh, technical lead for our identity management team at the University of Minnesota, who's been really helpful to us in many ways, but also talked through some of these issues with me. And, and, and my friend uh, Andromeda Yelton, who is wrestling with uh, these issues with her colleagues at MIT. Um, and last but not least, uh, I have to acknowledge and thank Lisa Hinchliffe, um, who uh, willed this uh, talk into existence, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, without whom I, I would not have been here. So, with thanks to Lisa, I will embark on my uh, defense of the proxy server. Um, I am not as well versed in um, RA21, CASA, any of these things, um, as some of you may be. So I'm going to speak purely from my experience and you know, with anecdotes from the University of Minnesota Libraries and how, um, how we deal with these issues. And in particular, the things that I see as benefits that we gain from the proxy server that I would be reluctant to lose in, in any other scheme. And I'm gonna look at that through four different lenses, um, privacy, security, business intelligence, and user experience. And like everyone who's spoken here, uh, at least from the second slot onward, I will warn that you will find duplication of themes and topics, and, um, and uh, I'll apologize for that once and be done with it. Sorry. All right, um, privacy. And uh, this is a little bit rudimentary, but I feel like I, I, I need to acknowledge it. So. When we're talking about electronic resources, we're talking about systems for search and access. And it's, I feel like, always useful to point out that when we're talking about search in a library context, it is important to equate it to reference. And those of us who've been to library school, um, you know, we know how, uh, at least I know how I was taught to protect the privacy of a reference transaction, that someone inquiring about a topic um, or after an information resource, something that should be held confidentially. And a search typed into a search box should be treated no differently. And likewise, access, be it uh, you know, in a web browser via a download or something like that, in my opinion, um, and I hope it's uncontroversial, should be equated to a circulation and should be protected the same way that we would protect a record of a circulation of a physical object. And in particular, I think that both of these uh, need to be governed uh, among, by, among other things, the ALA Code of Ethics um, that protects each user's right to privacy and confidentiality with information sought, which is to say searched for, um, received, downloaded. Um, and librarians uh, admittedly and um, perhaps inconsistently 
take a very hard line on privacy in, in these contexts. You know, we were taught in library school, um, at, at least I was again, that these were to be held incredibly private. Uh, we do not divulge circulation information, as a matter of course, even to the patrons to whom the item circulated. If you come back to our reference desk, our CERC desk, um, a week after you returned a book and say, I'm trying to put together my bibliography, uh, I checked out this book, but I forgot to get all the citation information. Can you help me? It's blue. I think it's by somebody named Smith or something like that. Um, we will tell you, I'm sorry, we can't, uh, we can't find that information. Um, the extent to which it is true that we are not able to find that information varies quite a bit from institution to institution. Um, uh, but that has been, I think, reasonably widespread practice that we, and, and it is admittedly sort of paternalistic. I understand the, uh, the ideals behind it, but just want to acknowledge that that is um, how we have treated physical circulation, how we've treated in-person reference tr transactions, and uh, I believe that we should strive to hold these electronic interactions to the same standards where, where possible. It's easier to hold uh, in-person reference transactions uh, up to a very high standard of privacy for a number of reasons, but not least among them is that people forget. If you come to me and ask me a question, I might remember a week ago, or a week later, you know, if someone comes up and asks me, you know, somebody flashes a badge at me or something like that, but I might not. Um, people forget. It's, uh, it's an important feature of people that we forget. Um, society uh, and our sanity, I think, probably relies on it. Um, software doesn't forget, at least most of it, and not by default. Um, the default status of most software and most systems is to remember um, and likely indefinitely, or at least until your partition fills up with logs. Um, and there's good reasons for this, for forensics, for debugging. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon us to assume that electronic resource usage generates records of information sought and received. On their own, these records aren't necessarily sensitive or infringing of privacy. But once usage is combined with identity, it becomes sensitive. It becomes subject to the American Library Association Code of Ethics, in my opinion. Uh, specifically, it becomes subject to Minnesota law for me uh, that governs uh, government data, um, where identity is connected to information sought or received that becomes private data um, that's, that's uh, governed by, by law. Of course, when we're talking about electronic resources, we're talking about licenses. Licenses require authorization. Um, we need to determine affiliation. We need to determine that uh, a license is current and that a user has the ability to, uh, to access that information. And authorization requires identity. Um, inevitably, there must be a link, direct or indirect, between usage and identity. Um, and so here, I, I want to move into my first defense of the proxy server. The proxy server is a firewall for identity. It is necessary to transmit search and access requests, but the proxy server allows us to vouch for the authorization of a user by granting them an IP address and keep their identity confidential, keep their identity information home at the institution. And the way that works in practice is that instead of for example, being identified by my edu-person principal name, which is not a required aspect of in common federated identity. This happens to be the identifier that the University of Minnesota sends by default to in common federation members. It doesn't have to be my email address, but it just so happens that this is my email address. This is personally identifiable, and this is information that our institution and our identity management folks do not consider private. Um, for good reason, we're a public institution. A lot of information that we have is public by law. Um, but this is definitely, I would argue, personally identifying. So when I move through the proxy server, instead of being myself at my institution, I'm an IP address. I might be 102, I might be 103, I might be 101. We run three uh, round robin style easy proxy servers. So my privacy is somewhat protected. 
there. Not only that, my, my privacy is, I would argue, further protected by the aggregation of thousands of users' activity into the streams from these three proxy servers. So that my research activity, the information that I access, the information that I seek, can disappear into the activity of the rest of campus. So it's not that identity and information sought are not connected in this scheme, but we control the server, we host Easy Proxy on premise, we control the logs where that connection is recorded of identity and information sought, and we can treat this data according to our policies, according to, our law, to law, according to our professional ethics, and according to the standards that we hold ourselves to that in many cases are higher than any of these documented laws, policies, et cetera. Specifically at University of Minnesota Libraries, we keep these identified logs for 30 days. I think this is a long time. I wish we didn't keep our, our logs this long. Um, it's our interpretation of uh, the requirements of our licenses that in order to respond to abuse claims, we need to retain logs so that we can trace activity back to individual users. Um, and so we consider this to be the bare minimum of time that, uh, that we can keep these logs. And so after 30 days, we de-identify all our logs. This elides into the, the second uh, lens that I want to look through here, which is security. Uh, I think it was Todd on the, on the first uh, opening talk talked about libraries who, or librarians who have a broad spectrum of ideas about information access and that there are some who believe that information should be accessible by any means. Um, I, I suppose that some of you may, uh, may see my stance on privacy or, or things like that as, as on the information by any means side, but I want to assure you that we take compromised accounts very seriously at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Why? Because we do use Shibboleth. Uh, we use Shibboleth uh, internally um, for all of our applications. It's a single sign-on system and a compromised account can enable a lot of worrisome things. Um, in very rough order, I would point out theft of financial aid for students. Theft of direct deposit, fraudulent tax filing. All of these happened this year at my institution. I'm sure they did at many of yours as well. Identity theft, HIPAA data integrity, FERPA data integrity. And somewhere down the list, unauthorized access to library resources. It's on the list, um, but I want to be realistic about where our, where our true concerns lie. We are. We take compromised accounts very seriously. We need to know about them as soon and as thoroughly as possible so that we can prevent uh, the things that we consider to be uh, more pressing concerns. And the wonderful thing about our proxy server is that it gives us a single point of observation uh, for access to, uh, of access to library resources, one place to monitor activity across all of our licenses to correlate activity between platforms. So here's an, I should point out here too that even though unauthorized access to library resources is down the list of reasons why we're concerned about compromised accounts, our proxy server is actually high on the list of useful tools for identifying compromised accounts. And it is because of the breadth of visibility that we have across these licenses through our proxy server. So, an example heuristic that we could look at is looking at simultaneous logins from multiple IPs, multiple countries. Todd and others talked about you know, scripts that you can use on easy proxy logs for these kinds of things. Um, but it's important to note that all, all of these are happening and could be happening across multiple resources, multiple publishers, multiple licenses. And they are much more difficult to detect if, they are, if our visibility into them is constrained into a, a, a specific silo from a particular resource provider where we might not get the full picture of what's happening under this account, or if our visibility into them is limited to the identity provider. I know this because we use Shibboleth 
uh, for login to our proxy server, and we catch things that are not caught at the identity provider level. Uh, whether that's just because of the sheer volume of data or because we have the additional information about uh, user behavior that is visible through the proxy server, um, I don't know. Another thing that this single point of observation uh, makes uh, is very useful for, for us is in verifying abuse claims. Um, and this is the excessive use, excessive downloading, things like that. Um, and uh, if you really want to hear me editorialize uh, vehemently, you can get me talking about this topic. Um, our proxy logs give us the forensic data that we need to determine whether the activity um, being reported by the publisher was actual malfeasance or simply a user clicking too quickly. Our electronic resource librarian estimates that maybe 15% of the complaints that we get from publishers about excessive use are legitimate. The vast majority of times, it's a user who's overly enthusiastic in their uh, interest in a journal. Um, in one recent case, an ebook uh, vendor's own platform was triggering excessive use uh, warnings because when you loaded up an ebook in the browser, it quickly downloaded a series of pages in the background to make them available for you, and that was tripping their own, um, uh, th their own abuse uh, algorithms. Um, so I, I'll, I'll editorialize very briefly here and see, say that this is another place where I feel like publishers lack credibility um, in, in that if they are at present willing to delegate the task of identifying abuse of their platforms, to some pretty dumb algorithms, I am really reluctant to turn over this role directly to them to put us in a position where we don't have the data to determine, no, actually, that's just somebody over in the chemistry building looking at a journal um, and, and not a, a Sci-Hub attack. All right, the third lens here, business intelligence. Because we have a single point of observation for usage of our electronic resources, we have a single stream of activity to monitor, allowing us to measure, measure usage across all our licenses consistently and independently. And that independent aspect is important to me personally, which is to say that if I had to answer to the university, to the provost, to the state, for the over $17 million that we will spend this year on collections, I would want to have independent information. I would not want to say, well, here's the counter stats where the people who were paying for these resources tell us um, how much they're being used. Um, I, would, I, I think this is a figure that justifies independent, uh, independent usage data. So uh, the next few slides are gonna have some figures on them and I, uh, it is not necessary for you to be able to read what's on there. I'll describe what the figures are. They're, they're really just illustrations. Um, so for business intelligence, my team extensively processes our de-identified proxy logs. Uh, we resolve DOIs and ISSNs that we find in those proxy logs so that we can provide usage stats per publication. We have an organizational data team that builds Tableau workbooks um, to help our selectors make purchasing, promotion, and cancellation decisions. So what you're seeing on the screen here is uh, a list of journal titles, um, ISSNs, and usage for a given period. Um, because this one's even harder to read, so I'll explain it, don't worry about it. Um, because we control the proxy server and we control its authentication routine, we can enhance our logs with affiliation information so that we can generalize about a user's relationship with the university even once we've stripped out their actual identity. Um, so what you're seeing here is a, a chart showing usage of the New England Journal of Medicine by college at the University of Minnesota. So you can see uh, the Academic Health Center, that bar goes right off the chart. They account for 78% of our usage of the New England Journal of Medicine, unsurprisingly. But then you can see usage by people affiliated with the College of Liberal Arts, Biological Sciences, Graduate School, Education, Human Development, et cetera. And we're only able to do this 
because we control our own proxy server. Um, here you're seeing uh, figures. Uh, so past slide was by uh, usage of a journal by uh, individual colleges. Here we've got usage of the Harvard Business Review and it's color coded to show usage by different user groups. So I've highlighted the sort of peach uh, sec segment there that is undergraduate use of the Harvard Business Review. We break usage of our journals down by undergraduate, graduate, staff, faculty, alumni um, in the cases where we have alumni access. Um, we're only able to do this because we control our own proxy server. Um, because we're able to see all of the information about uh, patron usage of our electronic resources. We find this information so valuable that we are actively seeking to increase the proportion of our usage that passes through the proxy server. Um, about a year and a half ago, our campus moved to using Edgerome as our primary uh, wireless network. Um, and uh, as a result, we had to remove the wireless network from our uh, IP whitelist. So at this point, any usage of electronic resources on our campus on Wi-Fi, which is significant, <laughs> um, goes through the proxy server. Uh, we've gotten zero pushback on this, uh, no complaints from users about it. Um, and so with that in mind, we're looking at other areas where we can increase the usage of the proxy server so that we can continue to, to build a better and better picture of how our licenses are being used. All right, the last lens that I'm going to uh, bring here is user experience. It could be better. Um, and here I, I tie us back to our, the, some of the conversation we were having earlier, um, and that, is it uh, Beth from OCLC? J Judith, sorry, um, was bringing up. Uh, I think the WAIF projects that uh, RA21 is working on look really nice, and I would really like to see something like that brought to uh, bringing users through our proxy server. I don't see any incompatibility there, and uh, I would be really interested in, uh, in seeing an effort from publishers to improve the discovery of a proxy server. Um, because, uh, as was noted uh, earlier, a public list of available proxy servers uh, might be dangerous, but we're already exchanging information with all of our all of our publishers about our proxy server addresses, our IP ranges. The process already exists there, um, and I think that all that is necessary is for, um, for publishers to look at something like WAIF as a way to connect users to a proxy server. So I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, in conclusion, our proxy server puts us in control of sensitive usage data um, to verifiably comply with policy, law, professional ethics. Our proxy server enhances patron privacy by aggregating usage. Our proxy server gives us a single place to identify compromised accounts. Our proxy server gives us the data necessary to investigate abuse claims. Our proxy server provides us with usage data to justify our budgets and to inform decision making. Thanks. <laughs>